Well, what's up, church? This is James. I'm one of the pastors here. Man, I, I can't tell you really what I'm feeling. I, I'm just kind of feeling somewhat torn. Uh, I'm torn because I really would love to see your face right now. I would really love to high five someone, give a hug to someone. But I'm also kind of excited because we're starting a new series. We're starting a new series called But God, and we're talking about the faithfulness of God. And it's, it's kind of crazy because we wrote this uh, message series or we started uh, going through this message series like months ago. And it just so happens that right now in the midst of everything we are going through, we actually have an opportunity to talk about the faithfulness of God. That even when there's been no change in circumstance, we can have a change in perspective. And so I'm excited. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I know over the next couple of weeks, God is going to move in a powerful way. And and so if you don't mind, would you let's just pray together. Father, thank you so much that you know what you're doing, that you are fully in control, that your hand has not left your people. God, that you are, are working things out. God, that you are up in heaven waiting to just pour out your presence on us. So, so Lord, we ask for your presence right now. Meet us where we are. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. So. I want to tell you that there's a scripture that you know, but you probably don't realize that you know. Here it is. It says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for you. Like you, you knew that scripture, but I know you don't, you don't think that you knew that scripture. Because here's the song that you probably would have heard. And I've been thinking about this song all week long. It's, it's very simple. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And I, I've been thinking about this song all week long as we've been kind of dealing with so many of the uh, things going on. And, and I was reminded of the pastor I had growing up and he would talk about the faithfulness of God, that God could put food on your table, that he has put shoes on your feet, that he can clothe you in your right mind, that he's both the same now and today and forevermore. Like he talked about the faithfulness of God. And I love this song because it brought me hope and faith. But the challenge was, as I started to get a little older and I started to look where the song came from, it actually comes from the book of Lamentations. I don't know if you've ever looked at the book of Lamentations, but Lamentations very simply means the passionate expression of grief or sorrow. It's weeping. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't sign up for that. Like, I didn't sign up for grief and sorrow. I signed up when I signed up for this Jesus thing for hope, for peace, for, for life, for, for freedom, for resurrection. I signed up for results. Like, I want Jesus to actually change my life. I want Jesus to change my family. I signed up for results. But have you ever been in a spot in your faith where it feels like things are empty? It feels like things aren't working the way you want them to be working. Like, here I am in the midst of this hallway right now, and this is empty. Like, I, I'm looking around and I don't see the results that I want at this particular moment. The songs that we sing, it's just, it doesn't feel like it's working anymore. It feels like my prayers are hitting the ceiling. The folks that I used to run with or used to be with, they're not here anymore. And, and it feels like nothing is working. It feels empty. Like I'm not getting the results that I want, but let me challenge you for a second. Maybe instead of, the, instead of results, maybe God is inviting you into something more. Maybe he's inviting you into something deeper. Maybe he's inviting you into something fuller. See, what if God wanted to expand our hearts? What if God wanted to expand our souls? What if he wanted to rekindle the intimacy with us? But what if it started with grief and sorrow? See, grief and sorrow are not things to avoid in our faith, but they are things that we should embrace. 
I want you to understand that this is not just a a Lamentations thing. This is not just some weird book in the Bible type of thing, but this is definitely an Old Testament thing. Two thirds of the Psalms are laments. David, the, the psalmist, David, the man after God's own heart, actually spent a good deal of his time crying out in grief and sorrow. Job, one of the infamous uh, books in the Bible, this uh, this religious guy comes in on the scene and most of his book is about lamenting. Jeremiah, one of the prophets who actually wrote Lamentation, spent most of his existence weeping. They call him the weeping prophet. But this is not just an Old Testament thing. It's also a New Testament thing. Paul talked about, hey, God's grace is sufficient. But right before that, he talked about how he had three thorns in his side and they wouldn't let up. And he prayed for God. He prayed over and over that and nothing happened. Peter talked about the suffering of Jesus and how we suffer. James talked about how we need to consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. And let's not forget Jesus. In John chapter 11, we know that Jesus wept. Isaiah, one of the prophets who was talking about the coming of the Messiah, we see that Isaiah says that Jesus was a man well acquainted with grief and sorrow. See, it seems like grief and sorrow need just as much space in our faith as hope and freedom. The men and women of our faith, they understood this. Jesus understood this. The fullness of our faith happens when we embrace both sides. When we embrace both grief and grace, when we embrace both sorrow and salvation, when we deal with both anxiety and hope, when we have the crucifixion and the resurrection, that's the fullness of our faith. See, when we choose one side, we have this fragmented faith that only works on Sundays. It only works when things are good. It only works when the lights are on. It only works when things are working out the way we want them to work out. But I believe God is inviting us into something more. See, when we choose both sides, we have a full faith that allows us to stand boldly and confidently in the midst of situations we are experiencing and say, but God, like you may be experiencing unmet expectations right now. You may have unanswered prayers. You may have unfulfilled dreams. You may have unbelievable circumstances and an uncertain future. But God has not forgotten about you. But God has a plan for your life. But God knows your name. But God, the same God who calms the wind and the waves, is actually here to meet you in your circumstance. But God is still moving. But God is still faithful, but God. So over the next couple of weeks, we just want to spend some time diving into what does it look like to actually trust God in the midst of what we're going through? What does it look like to have a change in perspective when there's been no change in circumstance or situations, but God? And as we jump into it this week, this is week one. And so I want to get it really simple for you, really practical. But here it is. Week one, we want to deal with unmet expectations. What do we do with unmet expectations? My daughter, Kyla, my youngest daughter, we were sitting at the dinner table uh, a few weeks ago and Kyla is sitting there and she's three years old and she's getting angry. And and so we're like, well, what are you angry about, Kyla? She says, I'm angry because all I want to do is put my hands in my mouth. I put my finger in my nose. She says, I want to touch the ground and touch people and hug people, but I can't because of this virus. And Kyla was really angry. And just so y'all know, whenever we get a chance to get back together and hang out, you probably want to just pause on hugging Kyla for a little bit. She's three. She's still figuring things out. But what I do want to tell you is that many of us are just like Kyla. We've got these unmet expectations. We expected things to go a certain way and they haven't. And oftentimes those unmet expectations feel like loss, feel like loss. Here's some of the losses that we go through. And these are, this is just a short list, but the unmet expectations that feel like loss, it's the loss of aging, right? The loss, the loss of actually your, your the mobility of your legs, like the, my knees 10 years ago don't work the same way they do now. The loss of dreams is something that I wanted to pursue and I, I, I stopped pursuing it and now I'm getting older and I probably don't have time to pursue it anymore. It's the financial loss. 
you of having to pivot and, and rebrand. And now for many of us, we're in a season where financially things are becoming tight because of unemployment and, and, and all of these things. There's the transitional loss. Some of my military folks, you guys are having to deploy every three years. And how do you make family? How do you how do you actually build community? How do you do that? But then what about the parents experiencing now their kid that went from uh, middle school to high school? And it used to be that you'd have a summer break as you transition from one grade to another. But now everybody's at home and those breaks don't exist. There's this transition. Then there's the catastrophic loss. It's that loss that we don't really like. It's the death of a loved one. And you've tried everything and, and you didn't really expect it, but it's the death of a loved one. It's also the silent loss. These are the losses that we don't really like talking about. The infertility, the miscarriage, the abortion, the abuse, the hurt, the pain, the emotional stuff that we don't really like touching. And then finally, this is the loss that I want us to kind of look at for a second. It's the loss of what we've understood about God and the church. We're standing in the midst of a pandemic and many of us are asking the question, Lord, where are you? Like, what are you doing, God? If you are really God, how come you haven't moved? And, and what's the church doing? What should we be doing? Like, What am I supposed to do? There's this loss. If you guys could get honest with yourself, if I'm honest with myself, I'm standing in the hallway right now and there's no people here. There's nobody to give a high five to. There's nobody to hug. There's nobody to, to, to just kind of praise with or dance with at the moment. This feels like loss. This hurts. Church, I need you to understand that you may have some unmet expectations, but God meets us in some unexpected ways. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Jesus invites us to a healthy way of dealing with loss and unmet expectations. Here it is. If you've got your Bible, if, you know, we've got it on the screen here, too. But it's Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Listen to what Jesus says. He says they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He's talking to his boys. He took Peter, James and John with him and became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Here's what I know. Reality can be really hard. See, Jesus had to go to the cross. He understood that he had to go to the cross. He had to he had to leave his friends like but these were the friends that he had spent the last three years of his life with. And not only did he have to leave his friends, but these friends would be denying him when he went to the cross and he's on the cross and on the cross. He would have to take on the sins of the world and be separate from his father. Talk about loss. Talk about just pain. And so Jesus teaches us that the way we deal with these unmet expectations is we've got to be willing to live in reality. Reality can be hard. And see, sometimes we face things in life that we don't really want to. Think about it, like the loss of a job. Uh, right now, we're in some spaces where we've got a loss of routine. There's the loss of space. There's a loss of control. And see, what's happening is our typical response to loss is actually being thrown out the window. Our typical response to hard stuff is usually avoidance or denial. Hey, spoiler alert, I can't avoid my kids anymore. Like, here's the, here's the truth. I, I can't deny that this thing is really hard right now. There's no way to get around this. So we actually start doing this stuff and we used to we've been used to doing this so often that what we'll do is we be push a beach ball down. I don't know if you've ever done that, but if you push a beach ball down in the water, you keep pushing and pushing and avoiding and denying. Eventually you keep pushing and it just pops up at the most inconvenient time. And so you and I have been so used to avoiding and denying our loss that we've pushed it down like a beach ball. And unfortunately, time doesn't heal all wounds. Sometimes it actually causes an infection. And now those things are jumping out in, in the sarcasm or you're yelling across the table from the spouse who, who you said you love. You're, you're screaming at your kids and, and you now you're struggling with anxiety attacks or high blood pressure and, and weight gain. Like, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm, I'm sitting sometimes on my couch and wondering why am 
am I still binge watching this show? And Netflix is giving me the, the prompt. Are you still watching? Yes, I'm still watching. Because this thing, I want to avoid some stuff. But Jesus gives us a different response. This one is hard. Jesus says the way that we respond to hard stuff is to grieve it, to actually grieve it. And I know that you, you and I, if we were sitting with Jesus when he was in the garden, that we would have told Jesus, hey, you're going to be all right. I, I got a few scriptures. I got a good verse for you. I got a good book for you. But the reality was that Jesus understood all of the scriptures. He was the scripture. Jesus knew the prophecies. He fulfilled the prophecies. And in this time, in this hard stuff, in this reality, he didn't offer us a cliche. He didn't offer us a cute little saying. But instead, what he offered us was an opportunity to grieve, to acknowledge that there was something of value that he lost. See, the appropriate response to unmet expectations, the appropriate response to loss and grief is to actually grieve it. I want you to get vulnerable with God, get vulnerable with yourself, get vulnerable with some safe people and say, this stinks. This is hard. I didn't ask to be in this. I never wanted, I never thought we'd be in a hallway preaching to when there's no people here. I know that you're online, but I can't see your face here. See, when we live in reality, we are forced to be vulnerable and vulnerability leads to deeper intimacy. Church, I wanna invite you to do something really quick. While you're on the chat, while you're in your home, if you could just get real with yourself for a moment, and I just want you to get real bold, get real honest for a moment, and I want you to type in the chat, this stinks. Get real. Kids, you can type in there too. Tell, Pastor, tell them that Pastor James said, I could say this, this stinks. This is hard, y'all. We're in the midst of a pandemic and none of us have been here before. This is difficult, but Jesus encourages us that we have to live in reality because when we live in reality, we're able to grieve. And when we begin to grieve, it's almost like our souls begin to expand. What's interesting is that we become a lot more compassionate to people because we know what it's like. See, when we start to live in our own pain, the way Jesus lived in his pain, we start to see that God has access to us. And when we allow God to have access to us, he starts to do more through us. We've got to live in reality. I want you to understand this too, that the first point is you live in reality. But the second one, it's, it's equally as important. You've got to know how to deal with this one, too. You live in reality, but you also have to know to listen in the in between. Here's what Jesus says in Mark 14, 35. He says he went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass by. He says, Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want you, your will to be done and not my own will. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch over for me uh, just an hour Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, what's crazy is that the hardest part or the biggest struggle that we have is not between us and the devil. Like, I need you to understand that the devil is defeated. The scripture says that he's like a roaring lion. That means that this brother looks like some toothless scar from the Lion King. He's done. He's defeated. And so the biggest struggle is not between us and the devil. The biggest struggle is between our will and God's will. See, I'm in this hallway, just like many of us are in this hallway of life. You're, you're, you're not quite there, but you're not quite done. The, things kind of started, but they haven't finished yet. Like you, you, you see something, but you're not quite there. You're standing in the midst of this hallway. You're standing in the midst of this tension. You're standing in the midst of this in-between. 
And I don't know about you, but my tendency when I'm in the hallway of life, my tendency is to will myself to the next place, to will myself to the next thing. I will be powerful. I will overcome this. I will conquer this. I will not be defeated. I will be better. I will not be controlled. And and those things might be true. But the problem is we find ourselves in these hallways of life and often our willpower runs out. See, it feels like God is distant. It feels like maybe he doesn't care. It feels like the devil is winning. And so we jump into action. We start chasing experiences of God that we had before. And we start chasing what he did for that person and chasing what he moved in and how he moved before. And then we get frustrated and we get angry when he doesn't move like that anymore. Here's what one writer says. I love this. He says, our spirituality can be an escape from Jesus and not us going to him. See, if we're not careful, y'all, we can actually use our willpower to take us out of the process that God wants to meet us in. Jesus understood that this wasn't about uh, this wasn't about him getting his way. This was about him actually doing the will of his father. He was in the in between trying to listen. Lord, what do you want me to do? Like, I I really wish you could take this thing away. I know that you could do this, but this is hard. Could you take this away? And God's response was no response at all. And Jesus tells us that it was God's will that he was following, not his own. What Jesus did is something that you and I don't like. Jesus in the hallway of life, Jesus, when he was in the in-between, Jesus decided to surrender. I know that's hard for us, right? Like nobody likes to surrender because when you surrender, it feels like you failed. It feels like you're defeated. It feels like you, you didn't win. It feels like you don't get results. But surrender is not a lack of faith. Surrender is the greatest act of faith that we can have because we're saying that God is so much bigger than us. God knows what he's doing. God can be trusted. See, you've got to understand this, that Jesus was not defeated, but he was saying that I trust God more than anything. And oftentimes the Hebrew word for trust in scripture is the word careless, careless. Like Jesus was careless with his faith. He said, Jesus, he said, God, whatever you want to do, I'm willing to do it with you. Let me give you some hope that you are not surrendering to a tyrant. You're not surrendering to an abusive father or a cruel judge, but you're surrendering to someone who would die for you. Someone that did die for you. Someone that loves you. He knows you and he hasn't forgotten about you. He wants you to surrender to him. See, It's in the surrender. It's in listening in the in-between that we see God for who he really is and not just who we want him to be. It's in the in-between that we we see who who we really are and not just who we wish we were. I got to tell you guys this, that people are not just looking for anything. People right now are looking for the real Jesus that can transform the real you, not just the Jesus who can transform all of the good stuff, not just the Jesus who can do all of the things that you like, but the Jesus who can transform the real you, whether you're in a fancy building, whether you're in a fancy suit or not, the Jesus that can meet you on your couch, the Jesus that can meet you in your neighborhood, the Jesus that can meet you when you've lost your job and somehow you still have hope. People are looking for the real Jesus. and They're looking for people to do his will. But what we've got to do, church, is we've got to listen in the in-between. See, I've got to listen to what is it that he's saying, what is his will, and I've got to listen to what he's saying about me. And I've got to listen to what he's saying about others. I need you to understand that Jesus didn't go to that garden alone. And you probably shouldn't either. So invite some folks on your journey right now. As a matter of fact, invite some folks in in the prayer, in the prayer room, in the chat. Invite them to go on this journey with you. If you could, let's go here for a second. I want you to listen in the in-between. And what I want you to do is I want you to get really, really quiet. Get quiet. Stop typing for a second. Allow the silence and the stillness. Allow the awkwardness of the hallway to meet your reality. Slow down for a minute and realize 
the God of the universe is in control. The God who says he's your friend is in control. The God who understands loss, who understands agony, who's wrestled in the garden, Jesus who's wrestled in the garden to the point of sweating blood, understands what you're going through and he wants to meet you right where you are. Here's the other piece. You've got to learn how to live in reality. We've got to listen in the in-between. Listen to what he's saying about you. Listen to what he's saying about himself. Listen to what he's saying about others. But then, but then, we've got to look towards the resurrection. See, Jesus lived in reality. He, he, he grieved the loss. He, he listened in the in-between. He even surrendered to his father's will. But then he says something that really rocks me. He says it uh, toward in verse 41 or first, uh, 42. He says, enough. The hour has come. Look, the son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let's go. Here comes my betrayer. I just, I just feel like energy listening to it. He says, rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. And some of you are probably saying, well, James, that's not good news. Like this brother's about to go to the cross. His betrayer is coming. Like, how is that good news? See, Jesus understands that there's a fuller picture here. Jesus understands that there's a fuller faith here. Jesus was looking towards the resurrection. He's telling his boys, guys, let's go. It's time to go. And he's not angry with his disciples, but he's letting his disciples know that it's time to move on. See, Jesus understood that the quicker that he got to his betrayer, the quicker he could get to the cross. The quicker he got to the cross, the quicker he could forgive our sins. The quicker he could forgive our sins, the quicker we could get to the resurrection. So I need you to understand, do your screaming, do your yelling, do your crying, wrestle with the Lord in the in-between. But when he says it's time to move on, rise, let's go. It's time to move on. See, here's the bad news. Jesus says to us some really bad news. Things will never be the same. Jesus says, guys, the hour has come. Things will never be the same again. We can't go back. I can't go back. You, you, you can't go back to your job the way it was. Your family will never be the way it was. The economy will never be the way it was. Things will never be the way they were. The bad news is things will never be the same. But the good news, <laughs> the good news is because of our hope in Jesus, nothing will ever be the same. Things will never be the way they were because Jesus says, rise, let's go. There's more to the story. And folks, as Christians, we get an opportunity to look towards the resurrection. That things may seem like it's not working. Things may seem like they don't make sense right now. But we serve a God who knows the end of the story. And not only does he know the end of the story, he knows what's going on right now. Let me just put it out there. The hard fact is that this pandemic has taken so much of our lives, our routines, our rhythms but I don't think for a second that God calls this. I know for a fact that God did not cause this. See, you got to understand that his wrath was satisfied on the cross. God is not spilling out his wrath. He's not angry with us. He's not trying to teach us something. But what God has done in this moment is what he does is he's not actually causing this, but he will use this. He will meet us where we are and use this for his glory. And church, here's how I know. I've already seen some resurrection. I've already seen some of the fruit of how this hard thing has actually met us in some unexpected ways. Here's one. The church is unified. Like all churches now are meeting online. We had an on, all of our campuses are at one spot. You're with us right now. We've got people all over the world watching. The church is unified. The message of the gospel is getting clearer and clearer. Denominations don't matter anymore. The po political parties don't matter anymore. The oppressive systems are starting to be exposed. Teachers, the folks who we, we underpay, now they're being recognized for the beast and the goats that they are. 
Give some shout outs to your teachers, by the way. Relationships are starting to be mended. Imagine that, husbands and wives are actually sitting and looking at each other for the first time and having real conversations. I mean, this is, this is stuff, faith and God is being renewed. On secular television, they're asking people about God. Church, I know this is hard. Things will never be the same. But the good news is, things will never be the same. Because the God we serve meets us in the midst of what we're going through. You may have unmet expectations, but God meets us in unexpected ways. Listen. Many of us are in the hallway right now. I don't know what tomorrow looks like. I don't know how this thing is gonna work out, but I know there's more to the journey. Will you meet me on the other side? All right, church. So here we are back in the hallway. Many of you will listen to this message and the reality is that many of us are going through so much right now, so much right now. I'm just, I'm grieved when I'm talking to college students and their whole lives have been just kind of just turned upside down. The teachers whose lives have been turned upside down, parents whose lives have been turned upside down, so many folks whose lives have been turned upside down. But here's what I want to invite you into today. That God actually wants to meet us in the midst of those things. Our God is not fragile. He's not afraid of the hard stuff. In fact, he invites us to deal with the hard stuff. So if you're sitting here today, something that was said in this message began to resonate with you, and you, you realize that, you know what, I've been going through this hard stuff alone. I've been going through this hard stuff without hope. If that's you, you're feeling hopeless, I wanna tell you that the God we serve has already been there, done that. Jesus Christ has already done what's necessary. He is our hope. So if you'd like to trust Jesus today, if that's something you're like, man, I, I've been sitting with this, I don't know what to do, I encourage you, just hit that button. Hit that button that says, I wanna be saved. Hit that button that says, I, I want Jesus to step into this situation. Hit that button. And maybe church, as you're watching the folks that are hitting the button, let's rejoice for a moment. Put some claps in the chat. Just, just get excited for what the Lord is doing right now. But I also want to pray for you too. Those of you who've been at this thing for a little bit and you're like, all right, I should have the answer to this. I know I got a little frustrated. I know I yelled at this person. I know I, I lost my cool before, but Lord, I, I'm coming back. Can I tell you, God's not angry with you, but he wants to meet you, you too. So if you need prayer right now, you're like, hey, I, I, just want, I just want somebody to meet me in my situation. I just, I just want someone to just pray with me. I don't want someone that's going to give me answers, but I need a Peter, James, and John that will pray with me in the garden. They didn't pray, but we got some folks in this chat who will pray with you. So I want to encourage you, just, put, just, just send the chat in. We've got our pastors on here. We've got our prayer partners on here. We've got our hosts that are ready and willing to pray for you. Church, I don't want you to miss this. That we can have a change in perspective even when there's no change in circumstance. We have a God who is so much bigger, but God, but God. You may be going through crazy things, but God. So someone right now, maybe you don't need prayer. Maybe you, you don't need to be saved. Maybe you just need to rejoice. Maybe you need to let some of those tears out. Maybe you need to yet, let, yet that hallelujah out. Maybe you just need to say, Lord, I'm ready to go. It's time to rise and let's go because God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is willing to step into my situation wherever you are right now. Allow Jesus to meet you there. Let me pray with you. Lord, thank you so much that you are faithful. Great is your faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, all I've ever needed, all we need right now, your hand provides. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me. In Jesus' name I pray.